This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception and Action podcast, my interview with Paul Venner, head of athletic performance at Dutch Baseball and founder of Ultimate Instability. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Paul Venner. Paul received his Master's in Strength and Conditioning from St. Mary's University in London. Along with coaching a variety of different sports, he is the founder of Ultimate Instability, which is developing innovative products to add variability to training. In the interview, we discuss the important role of movement variability in training, using water to amplify information about movement, connecting skill acquisition and strength and conditioning through the lens of organismic constraints, and Paul's presentation at the upcoming Florida Baseball Ranch Dutch Baseball Skill Acquisition Summit on September 8th and 9th. Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Okay, today my guest is Paul Venner, head of athletic performance at Dutch Baseball and founder of Ultimate Instability. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Paul. Hi, Rob. Thank you for having me on this podcast. Oh, you're welcome. And to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of the career path that you followed to to where you are now? Uh, Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's good for that to tell a little bit of a story about uh, my formative years as a kid. I was always really sportive and uh, doing a lot of different sports, not really talented, but uh, just really driven and like to train hard, that type of kid. And then around my 12th year, I got involved in track and field and I really liked this. And uh, also because I wasn't reliable on others and I was fully responsible for my own uh, performance and outcomes. And uh, But I was uh, training at a really local, small countryside club where I grew up. And we didn't even have a proper track mm-hmm. uh, and not even to think about proper coaches. <laughs> <laughs> so there were just some fanatic parents. And I actually ended up like coaching myself at a young age and uh, being around, like figuring out stuff myself, experimenting and intuitively looking back at it. I was actually applying like differential learning and uh, applying chaos and like a lot of variation into my training. And then... Uh, I got selected for a regional training group uh, and I got a chance to train really good athletes, uh, even Olympians. And I made a lot of progress and I grew physically. Uh, I was about 15, 17 around that time. But even though I had really good numbers on all the lifts and performance outcomes, uh, p- performance tests, uh, I could never really transfer it into the actual sport performance. And in particular, uh, during a, a really important event such as a national championship or something. So this really drew my interest into the concept of transfer training. And it was a really logical choice for me to study at the sports and human movement. Mm -hmm. And this is actually where I uh, met Franz Bosch. And he had some really interesting ideas that, yeah, made me figure and really sparked some things and uh, really resonated with my own experiences and practice. Like, because basically, what I've done as a as a kid intuitively without a coach probably made more sense than some of the aspects that I was doing uh, when I started <laughs> listening to a coach. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think you see that when kids play sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they seem to know. And, so mm-hmm. yeah, and, and and so I was fortunate enough to to have been studying under him uh, since a very young age. So yeah, I kind of didn't know anything else than like that pathway from going from skill acquisition and motor learning and uh, all those aspects, uh, looking at it uh, at strength training from that aspect as well. And then I had the opportunity to uh, study at the Olympic Institute uh, in Sydney, Australia uh, within strength and conditioning. And and I started out with looking at the concepts of uh, how to train the hamstrings uh, in the national female soccer training a team for a sprint performance. Uh, this was really, this was a dream coming through, like a Wahala of sports working in the strength and conditioning, uh, all the equipments available and measurement tools. And I really had an awesome time, but 
here I also noticed like the paradigm of the more traditional strength and conditioning. And it made me wonder uh, with a question of uh, why are we actually moving so fixed and unpredictable in the strength room with fixed exercises, mm -hmm. fixed sets and reps, while real life situation that is actually cru crucial for uh, performance or health is often like suddenly unpredictable and unexpected. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kept me thinking. And uh, after the internship, obviously I went for some travel being in Australia <laughs> and, and, but, but it kept going in my head. And then at some point, like I got this uh, Eureka moment that, that I thought water, you know, if, if you can do an exercise with, uh, moving water is actually much more unpredictable mm -hmm. and you do the same exercise but you do it differently every time and that, that was basically how how i came to building the the products and the, the brand of ultimate instability okay yeah and then um how did you come to be how did you come to be with uh dutch baseball yeah that's quite funny <laughs> like at, at, at the same time as uh when i got back in the netherlands and i started uh, developing those ideas and uh, products. Obviously, I also needed uh, money to make mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, yeah, starting a, a business doesn't c uh, only cost money. Okay. And obviously, uh, I really yeah like to work and like to work in uh, the strength and conditioning. So I had a chance to work with the Netherlands Olympic Institute in the south, mm -hmm. um, and there I got to work with uh, whitewater canoe and actually baseball that was actually actually one of my first programs mm -hmm. so I, I got involved since 2010 and there also actually i i first met uh, bart and martijn who are also gonna present at the, at the summit mm -hmm. and yeah from there from the small academy later i got asked to do work with the the youth national team and then with the national and well at kept on going and then since almost three years i'm doing full-time they're you know, working with uh, the netherlands baseball and softball oh that's great yeah that's yeah that is a really interesting path uh, um i i think that's really common to take our own experiences as athletes into uh, into uh when sports science twist um i feel the same way so um i know a topic that you've been looking at in in your practice a lot is one of my favorite things to look at is is movement and motor variability uh can you tell us a bit about what you've been doing with that and how you deal with that in in strength and conditioning yeah it's really a topic a topic that i'm really excited about Sometimes it becomes like a buzzword or that people don't even like really understand what it actually is. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes uh, yeah, then people just end up with, yeah, you just need to move different and in a lot of different ways. Um, so actually, I also really liked your podcast with some previous guests, uh, the ones where you outlaid uh, the Bernstein mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so I, I definitely encourage people to listen back to those if they haven't already. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for me, where I look at is how can I apply it in strength training? So basically, like every movement is different. Every similar movement is different. There's no such thing as an identical movement, maybe in a robot, but not in a living organism. And this Ed Bernstein quote, repetition without repetition. But often uh, we look at it as being unavoidable or unwanted noise. But I think more and more we, we find out that it actually, it's really beneficial for the movement system and for, especially also for learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it has also a really important place. So what I do in the strength and conditioning is uh, trying to find exercises that actually allow the body to self-organize into the wanted outcome. Okay. So really focus on really clear outcomes uh, and then allow, yeah, allow some options in there. Okay. So to, to give a concrete example, mm -hmm. um, and I'll, this is also where I'll be talking about at the summit. If we do a really heavy lift, we automatically constrain the body into a small window of movement options because the, the weight is dictating this or even... Uh, more further on the line, if we move in a fixed uh, fitness apparatus, 
the trajectory is already set out. So there's not much to deal with in terms of uh, where the movement is going to end. Basically, a lot of degrees of freedom are already uh, taken away by the machine. Mm-hmm. By doing more exercises where actually the, the athlete really needs to work hard on getting the desired outcome, uh, I think that's that's really beneficial. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So is it just trying to... To you mentioned using water. What are some of the other ways that you try to to do that? Encourage variability. It can be through using different targets. Mm-hmm. For, let, let's say with the, with the water, for example. Mm-hmm. If you normally do a, a clean with a, a fixed barbell, mm-hmm. there is there is some information, but particularly in someone who's starting to learn, you the the obvious way to go is to just take a lighter bar or even a broomstick, but actually you take away all, all the information that normally the weight is providing for the lift. Mm-hmm. And then you see people doing these artificial movements that are actually not really coming from the constraints that are on the task. Okay. Now, now if you do a clean with a aquabag and you have the water moving, you actually get more information like your left arm is pulling harder than your right arm, you're going to notice this straight away because the water amplifies uh, the effect. And, and this creates an unpredictable water flow, uh, the inertia that you need to, to act on. So this way, you get more information in in the, the movement you're actually doing. No, no, that's really nice. Yeah, I think that's kind of an underused technique, kind of the... Amplific- uh, even error amplification where I know another one that I've been talking about with people that, that we use sometimes in baseballs, like when you have people swing with a really flexible shaft, um, in golf, sometimes we do that too, where it, if you're out, you're, you're snapping your wrist or anything, it really, you'll really see it and feel it. Yep. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think that that's a really nice technique. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we, I, I use a lot of unexpected perturbations and uncertainty um, so even with a, a fixed exercise by uh, having some variations in there uh, the, the person uh, needs to adapt all the time instead of just going through through the motion or through the the, the f- fixed uh, task the other one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was your master's thesis um, that you did a looking at a, a constraints led approach for baseball hitting. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did there? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, within this constraint led approach, I think there's a lot of attention for different ways to manipulate uh, the task or environmental constraints. Also a lot of research in those areas. However, the organismic constraints, they are often like taken for granted or they are, I think, often overlooked as a really strong potential steering mechanism for this uh, motor output. And even though I, I've read in some early work about fatigue is being mentioned as an organismic constraint, I, I don't think it ever really got the attention that it, it potentially deserves. Franz Bosch describes some in, in his book, but yeah, I really like to to test it out and see how we can apply it in practice. So the basic idea is if, if you do a fi- the same task uh, with the same environmental constraints, uh, but you pre-fatigue the body, you're dealing with a different body every time you, you do the task. And this uh, challenges the body to explore different solutions. Uh, so basically, we set up one group who did a 45-minute hitting skill session with external focus, cons- constraint-led approach. Mm-hmm. And afterwards, they did their 45-minute strength session. And the other group, we did a combined session of 90 minutes uh, where they did exactly the same exercises, sets and reps. Only every time, right before they did their hitting drill, they had to perform a strength exercise. Uh, and, and that could be like a single leg squat or a dumbbell row or a push up or jumps or sprints or whatever. And what we found after a six week period w- was that we saw an improvement in their bed speed uh, measured by time from heel contact to estimated ball contact in both groups, but significant, significantly more in the uh, mixed group. And also 
after a four week retention period, the improvements became even bigger okay. where the other okay. group maintained uh, their current level. Of course, there were some limitations to the study and there were some unfortunate dropouts that, that caused the, the, the power to, to drop, mm-hmm. but the findings and also just the, the practical, uh, what I saw and the reactions I saw with the athletes and that I observed really made me enthusiastic about this concept. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you completely the, that we kind of have not done enough on the organismic side of constraints. And I'm always saying that this is how skill S and C can connect with skill acquisition better, you know, because they can, they can directly, you can directly influence skill acquisition by changing the constraints there. So, so was your, was your argument that, you know, by doing this, you get to kind of learn to adapt to changes in your own constraints, your, through, through doing the strength training with the hitting together? Yeah, I, I think there are a few interesting things. Uh, I think you might yeah, improve the exploration mm-hmm. within the movement to succeed. I also think there is a little bit of a contextual interference effect because you are uh, switching more between various uh, ta- uh, tasks. Mm-hmm. I think that also helps maintain your attention better and it actually builds up some kind of a time pressure because yeah, you just have done an exercise and with a skipping heartbeat, you're rushing into the bedding cage and you need to focus again. There's a little bit of more of a push naturally uh, also to, to be more in an external focus with less time to think about internal stuff. Uh, so I think there are a variety of, of reasons and definitely, like you say, I think it's a really good way to uh, bring skill acquisition and and the actual technical sports together with the strength and conditioning strength and coordination mm-hmm. uh, work and and look at it like from the same uh, same side yeah no I, I totally agree and i think what i also see sometimes is you know we see in sports you know with athletes having trouble when they get fatigued or they get pressured and um and then you ask the coach well when do you practice shooting or penalty kicks and they say oh at the start of practice <laughs> right right so you're right you got to give athletes the opportunity to adapt to these changes in their own constraints definitely yeah and, and it's also like in the in competition you also need to deal with uh, certain things and uh, you might have to play while you have uh, a little pain somewhere and so your body also is gonna try to work its way around it I guess the the last uh, point I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned this uh, uh, briefly, but I just wanted to uh, ask if you could give us a preview of your talk you're going to be giving at the upcoming uh, Skill Acquisition Summit next month at the Florida Baseball Ranch. Yeah, cool. I'm really excited to that one. Um, Really looking forward to it. Well, basically, in the morning, Franz Bosch and and you will have put an extensive uh, theoretical framework, I think with a lot of knowledge bombs and a, a lot of uh, <laughs> cool things for the attendees. Uh, what I will do in my presentation is like really uh, convert uh, the, the work of Franz, Franz Bosch into uh, really practical applications within uh, strength and conditioning. So I'm really gonna look at assessing movement for, from this uh, dynamic systems framework and looking at it how do do you address it in specific exercises and and then how does a a progression uh, look like and also what are the differences from this approach compared to uh, the traditional viewpoint so and and where does this clash and and where is there uh, uh, overlap yeah, that sounds good. And then, then um, I guess I don't know quite what I'm doing for this either. So you might have, but on the Sunday, are you going to kind of do um, more hands on showing some of the exercises you do and things like that for Sunday sessions? Cool. Yeah. So within the presentation, mm-hmm. yeah, I've got some more time to elaborate on certain exercises and, and how you build them up and, and why. And uh, I also go into some of the like key principles behind the exercises and like behind movement with the Sunday, uh, practical, uh, yeah, we've got a chance to really put it into practice and, uh, show it. And also like with the small individual details that are playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 
I'm really happy with that setup because uh, normally there's there's no no time for that, mm-hmm. like to put it in that way. And too often I see people uh, ending up with uh, just throwing a lot of new exercises on their athletes. I really like to show how you can make it also really individual. So from this movement assessment, you can really look at what does a particular athlete actually need to work on and how do you then work on that and how do you coach it uh, through the constraint that approach instead of uh, just telling uh, that they need to bend their arm or mm-hmm. some internal cue. Ah, well, that, that sounds really great. I look forward to, to hearing your talk. And uh, this has been great, Paul. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Yeah, thank you. And uh, looking forward to meeting in real life in a few weeks. Yes, definitely. (laughs) Thanks again for the great discussion, Paul. Really looking forward to seeing your presentation at the summit. You can find out more about Paul and the Florida Baseball Ranch Summit from the links I posted in the show notes. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. If tears were liquor.